Amen, amen, amen. So bacon is coming because it's Father's Day, but first we're going to get started in God's Word because you're going to earn that bacon, amen? All right. Um, So today we are in the third week of Proverbs, and today we are looking at what the book of Proverbs has to say about something that's very, very close to a lot of dads' hearts, work, work, career, job. I'm just going to give you a second. You okay? Work. It's a big topic. Um, When I was maybe 11 or 12, I had my very first job. We're going to look at what God's word says about work. I had my first job. It was a paper route. And in Illinois, a paper route was a bit of a different thing because there was snow. Amen. And so they would drop it off and it's dark outside. You got a pile of papers. You got to go out in the snow as an 11, 12 year old kid and you're delivering all these papers. And man, I earned those first bits of money. And I say bits of money because you don't get paid a whole lot for a paper route. But it, but it was awesome, and I loved doing it. And, and in the Midwest, you detassel corn because there's corn in the Midwest. Anybody want to know what detasseling is? We had two hands uh, for service. Okay, detasseling corn is like once you're 13 or older in the Midwest, you get to walk cornfields. And as you walk cornfields, there are these tassels. And you pull them out of the top of the corn and you throw them on the ground because there's a whole scientific thing about fertilization that I don't quite understand. I just know I got a paycheck at the end of the day. And it was so great. And it was the biggest paycheck that I had ever had. I think I, think I detasseled corn for, for three years. Um, I did that. And the first few paychecks were just absolutely amazing. I'd never seen so much money before. And um, there was this new technology that was out that hardly anybody had. Just a few of my friends had. And, and we didn't have it yet. It was called a microwave oven. Just dating myself a little bit. And um, so I took those first few paychecks and I bought our houses, my mom's first microwave oven. And I was so proud and we cooked everything in the microwave, everything, whether it was good or not, because it was so much better. Um, anyway, so, so after detasseling corn, I got a job at Taco Bell, which employee discount at Taco Bell, Amen was awesome. Um, I did Taco Bell for several years and then went into college and worked at McDonald's, which after that, I didn't eat at McDonald's for like a few years, which is just a little side note. I won't spend any more time on that, but that was McDonald's. And then when I graduated college, I kind of had this idea, and some of you guys did too, that like when I get my college degree, I'm going to like, you know, I'm going to walk the aisle, they're going to hand me my diploma, and then there's going to be an employer there saying, please, please, please work for us, let us give you all kinds of money. And shockingly, that didn't happen to me. Um, I don't know about you, but it didn't happen to me, and so I went to work for a company called Kinko's, and Kinko's hasn't been around for a while, some of you guys know Kinko's, but you would make copies at Kinko's and get charged for it crazy, right? So I helped people make copies at Kinko's, and it was my job, and that's, that's my very first job out of school. And there was this one night where um, somebody walked in very, very late at night. I worked second shift, and they had this full-color presentation that they needed to make the very next day for a client, and they were super like uh, stressed and anxious about it because it was a deadline, and they were behind, and they had procrastinated and all this kind of stuff, and it's like, no, I'm going to save your life right now, Kinko's guy right here, and I'm going to make this presentation, and it's going to be awesome, man. I hopped to it. And I helped this guy, and it was so great. And he, when he finally got his end product at the end of the night, for real, this happened to me. He's like, oh my gosh, if you can bring this much hard work to my presentation, I would love to talk to you this week. He's like, we've got some job openings over at this con- computer consulting company that I work for. And that's how I got my very first job in computer consulting, was by doing a good job at Kinko's with copies. Amen? Amen. And sometimes it happens that way. It doesn't always happen that way, but sometimes it does. I eventually became a computer programmer, did that career for about 10 years, and then eventually became a pastor. You're like, how old are you? (laughs) Really, really old. All right, we're talking about work today. Work. Uh, Some estimates say that before we die, many of us will work an average of 90,000 hours. Did you know that? One third of your life is work. One half of your waking hours, non-sleep hours, you are at work. It's kind of a big deal. And some of us are having a great time at work, and work is very fulfilling, but some of us, work is a burden, and work is something that we get through so that we can do other things that we would rather do 
Yes? Work can be complicated. And so we're going to look at what the Bible has to say today, specifically Proverbs, because that's a series we're in, about work. Look at this, a very direct challenge right away. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6, about work. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Come on. One, one, one version says, you slackers. Take a lesson from the ants. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor all summer. I'm going to pause there really quick. What's the author of Proverbs? This is Solomon. What's he actually saying? So he's using a word picture here, and he says, look at this little creature called the ant. The ant does not have a supervisor. Yet the ant works really, really hard. And you're like, well, don't ants have queens? Yeah, and we just use that word, but they don't really give orders in an ant colony. If you actually study the science of it, it's built into their DNA, and there's a whole beautiful, wonderful way that everything comes together for ants. But the point is, they all just do their thing. They all just work. And Solomon's coming in saying, look at the ant for just a moment and realize They work hard without a supervisor beating on them to do it. And that's important for us because some of us in our work, if we're honest, we work a little bit harder when the supervisor is in the room looking at us, amen, Amen. than when they leave. What Solomon's trying to say is if you want to work well, you should be a self-starter. You should be a self-motivator. You should get the work done no matter what. Don't be the lazy kind, right? Next, verse 8, they labor hard all summer gathering food for the winter. But you lazy bones, he says it again to us, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? Hold on, Solomon, you're going after my alarm clock now. Back off, dude. But he is. He's like, work hard. Get up, you lazy bones. This is your Bible. He's talking about working hard versus laziness. He's right in here on work, isn't he? And notice what he says in this second part here. He specifically hones in on they labor for the summer and they store it up for the winter. They don't spend everything immediately that they make. Some of us live paycheck to paycheck. And he said ants know how to save. Some of us are spending more in our lifestyle than what we make. And we're experiencing difficulty as a result. So not only are ants self-motivated, but ants know how to save to a savings account. Amen? All right, next verse. Look at this. Proverbs 26, 13. It says, the lazy person claims. We're still on laziness, by the way. There's a lion on the road. Yes, I'm sure there's a lion out there. So a, a lazy person even makes excuses for why they're not working. There's always a reason why I slept in. There's always a reason why I couldn't make it to work today. Be careful of excuses is what Proverbs is trying to say. Now, I'm going to keep moving here. Proverbs 10, 4, lazy people are soon poor. Hard workers get rich. Now, pause there really quick. So we're still on hard work versus laziness. Proverbs is pretty direct, isn't it? It's telling us how to live. It's telling us how to be wise. In here it says, lazy people are soon poor. Now, this is something we've been talking about since we've been in the book of Proverbs. You can't look at a proverb by itself and think it's telling you all the truth about life. Also, you cannot look at a proverb, a single proverb by itself, and think that it's an absolute promise of God. That if X, always there will be Y. That's not what it's trying to say. What it's trying to say is that often, most of the time, The more lazy you are, you won't make as much money. And the harder you work, the more wealthy you'll get. Now, isn't it also true that sometimes lazy people get rich? Right? That sometimes happens. And sometimes really hard workers lose all their money in a crisis. So uh, that is absolutely true, which is why you take the proverb. Pastor Tanner talked about this last week. You take the proverb and you look at it in context of the other proverbs. You put it all together so that you can get a very nuanced, complete, three-dimensional picture of how this life works. And we're all about work today. Doing okay so far? Okay, next, Proverbs 12, 24 says, Diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in forced labor. Now, I'm going to talk about slavery in just a second, but look at what this thing is saying on the surface. It's talking about promotions 
versus demotions. Saying, listen, if you work hard, you will likely get promoted. You will likely be in more and more of a supervisory role in your life, in the kind of options and jobs that you're chosen for because you've proven yourself to be faithful and a hard worker that often gets noticed and you often get promoted. And that leads to greater freedom in your life, greater creativity, sometimes more money. But when you're lazy, often your options start to become more and more and more limited, right? We've seen this in the world before. And let me just um, acknowledge this quickly. Forced labor, forced labor, you saw that. Here we are on Juneteenth, and it's talking about forced labor there. Now, to be clear, all forms of slavery have big, big problems, The very special kind of slavery that was introduced into American culture, part of the evil that was that slavery was the fact that people were kidnapped based on their race. They were kidnapped and they were brought into a lifetime of servitude and their servitude was absolutely mandatory and attached to their race. They were take, their, their rights were taken away. They were treated as if they were not human beings. And the judgment of God for that is still on our culture. I don't have time to explain all of that today. But we are trying to heal by the grace of Jesus. We are trying to heal from that time. Amen? Trying to heal. But not all versions of forced labor or slavery in the ancient world were the same. If you go back to these cultures, often what this was, was this was called indentured servitude. It was a common practice in those societies that if you got yourself into debt, one of your options was to go into full-time servitude to a master while you worked to pay off the debt. It was not attached to your race. It was not lifelong, and your rights were not taken away. You worked for a limited period of time. You worked off your debt, and then it was done, and then you were set free. That's the way that that was supposed to work. And there were a lot of different versions of that forced labor there. But specifically what it's talking about there in Proverbs is this kind of demotion into a a, a worse and worse work situation, essentially. Again, slavery is such a big topic. Let me just be clear today that slavery is absolutely spoken against in your Bibles. There are spots where, where you can see that the authors of Scripture are speaking as if, a, as if slavery was an institution in their culture, but read the book of Philemon. If you've got any questions at all, read the book of Philemon. You will see where the Apostle, Apostle Paul stands on the issue of slavery. Amen? Amen. Okay, so let's keep moving then. Um, this is Proverbs 13, 11. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. This is Proverbs just coming in with a piece of advice and saying when it comes to work, don't give in to get rich quick schemes. We all need to hear that, right? Especially in our teens and 20s. Like there's so many things that look like really valid shortcuts that you can take to wealth. And Proverbs, this really ancient documents coming in and saying, don't pursue any of those. Question those, right? Be be skeptical of those kinds of options. Instead, what should you prefer? Prefer this little by little wealth growth. That's safer. It's smarter. All right, now we're going to talk about sleep. Proverbs 20 verse 13. Love not sleep lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes, and you will have plenty of bread. We're talking about alarm clocks again, all right? And this time, it's not saying don't sleep. It's saying what? It's saying don't love sleep. Now, Pastor Tanner talked about this last week. Sometimes you've got to hold one proverb in tension with another proverb in order to get the three-dimensional view of what that truth is. So let's look at this one, but I'm going to give you another verse, Psalm 127, 2, so that you can see how they balance each other. In vain, it says, you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he, that's God, grants sleep to those he loves. It's interesting. So sleep's not all bad. Where's my sleepers out there? Amen? Right? Sleep's not all bad. Sleep is... According to the Psalms, sleep's a gift of God. It's okay to rest. 
In fact, we're told to Sabbath one day per week. Amen? And Sabbath for New Testament believers after the cross of Jesus Christ set us free from the law. Sabbath is not a law for us, but Sabbath is a blessing. And if you step into a healthy rhythm of rest in your life, you will be stronger as an individual. It will do something to your identity and it will do something to your stress level. Sabbath. So rest is good. Sleep is good. And God grants sleep as a gift, but don't love sleep. Do you see how the scripture is coming together and giving you a kind of a a well-ordered view of this thing? One more thing about sleep. Proverbs 3, 20 through 24. My son, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Preserve sound judgment and discretion. And verse 24, when you lie down, you will not be afraid. And when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. So now we're talking about the quality of sleep. Notice the quality of our sleep. It does not come from working all kinds of overtime hours and losing your mind. What does it come from? It comes from wisdom. It comes from doing your work with justice and good judgment. And and, and to me, that's how you put the whole thing together. It says, hey, listen, don't toil and think that if you lose all kinds of sleep, you're just going to keep getting ahead, and that's the whole secret to life. It's not just that. You've got to have balance with your ambition. But at the same time, what really leads to great sleep is justice and wisdom. Okay, time for a bacon break, amen? Anybody want some bacon? All right, here we go. Let the music go. We've got ushers right now in the aisles who are passing trays of bacon to you. Brother, thank you. (laughs) If you've been with us before, you know this is always the test because um, right now I have choked more years than I've survived. So I'm going to drink first. That's good. The problem is I always try to eat too much of it. It's good. Don't be so choosy while you're passing the trays, by the way. Just let them go. Grab one and let them go. I know. It all looks so good. And we get the extra thick bacon for you. Hopefully at home you've got your bacon too and you're enjoying that. Um, While you're doing that, I would just like to point out, I'm still trying to chew up here. I'd like to point out that Eric and Karen Smith cooked out on the grills this morning. Give them a hand, would you? And David and Lori Seaman as well were also cooking this morning so that we could have bacon all three services. Mm. I need about a gallon of water up here. I'm all right, though. I'm all right. Okay, um, so that's your bacon moment. Go ahead and chew, and I will continue to preach. Amen? Everybody doing okay? Okay, so let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 16. I'm going to keep us moving. And I know you're still passing trays and you're not listening to what I say and that's totally fine. (laughs) Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 16. Okay, this is a a wonderful, wonderful passage. Um, Ecclesiastes is a special book also written by Solomon, the same author of Proverbs. Again, the wise King Solomon wrote this book and he says, and this too is a very serious problem. People leave this world no better off than when they came. All their hard work is for nothing like working for the wind. Throughout their lives, they live under a cloud, frustrated, discouraged, and angry. Now, if you're actually listening to me right now and you listen to this passage, you're like, why is that so depressing? Has anybody out there ever been frustrated by your work? Yes? Have you ever been working and feeling like you're not getting ahead? Have you ever been working and feeling like, am I even going to have anything left over at the end of my life to hand off to my children? And you've questioned those things. And difficult moments have happened. And Solomon's drawing all this out. This is one of the great things that Solomon does in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, in my view, is the most depressing book in the entire scripture. But it's also incredibly insightful. Because what he does is Solomon's got all this wisdom, he's got all this power, he's got all this money, and he uses it, and he says, I'm actually going to walk all these roads, and I'm going to see if I can get true human fulfillment out of money, for instance. 
And he tries everything he can with money. He tries everything he can with education and with wisdom. He tries to see if that could lead to his fulfillment. He even tries pleasure and sex. And he goes all the way down that road. And he, he doesn't withhold anything from himself. And he comes to the very end and says, I tried all these different things that you might think would be fulfilling. And I found that they aren't fulfilling. Instead, he comes to the end and he says, they're meaningless. They're like a chasing after the wind. That's his summary statement on all, for pretty much all of human life. And so what we're reading here is his statement about work. And he says, this is a really serious problem that sometimes we look at our work and we're really frustrated by it. Now let's talk about work for just a second. In the book of Genesis, God comes to Adam and Eve, and you might remember this passage, chapter 2, verse 15. And it said, the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. It's the very first job that we see in Scripture is that God asks Adam and Eve to be gardeners. And he gives them this work. And seemingly in the beginning of Genesis, the work, the job goes well. God gives them a purpose together. But then sin comes into the picture. Do you remember that? And when sin comes into the picture, God speaks a curse over the creation. And specifically, he comes to the woman and said, you're now going to experience pain in childbirth. Do you remember that? And so everything got complicated in what this this whole area that should have been super joyful and wonderful all on its own got complicated. Then he comes to the man and said, cursed is the ground because of you. Cursed is the ground, and you're going to work, Adam, in the heat of the day, is what God says. And there's going to be thorns and thistles, and it's going to be rough. And God God brings that curse in, and it makes things difficult. Some of you guys are in your jobs today. It's this moment of honesty. And you're like, why are things so tough? And I would say to you, part of the reason things are tough today is because we aren't experiencing what the design originally was. We are experiencing the broken version of this creation, and we're specifically experiencing the broken version of work. That should impact us. Verse 18, Solomon continues. He says, even so, even though this is all really disturbing for us, even so, I've noticed one thing, at least, that is good. It is good for people to eat, drink, and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life that God has given them and to accept their lot or their share or their reward in this life. So let's pick this part apart. First off, he says, I've noticed this thing under the sun. That's a special Solomon phrase for him to describe everything that happens on planet Earth. Now, why is that important? Because he's not describing to you what is God's perfect will in the kingdom of heaven. Do you remember the Lord's Prayer? We pray, oh God, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because there's a difference, isn't there? And so Solomon is saying, what I'm telling you right now is how it works under the sun. How it works on planet earth. And he's coming to us and saying, hey, just like your car has an operating manual, I'm coming to you and I'm telling you how this world works. I'm telling you how life works, how money works, how alarm clocks work, amen? I'm telling you how all of this works. And I'm trying to give you the manual because if you would do what the manual says, you're going to face fewer life consequences and work is actually going to work. Take that in for a sec. Many of us grew up in the church, and every verse in Scripture, it was weaponized against us. People took verses and said, if you don't do this verse, you're going to hell. Can we be real? And many of the things that we did that were biblical were based on fear. And that was never God's will for us. It's the very reason that Jesus Christ came and died for you was to satisfy the requirements of the law. That's what the scripture says. He satisfied the requirements of the law and he made you new so that you can appear before God clean, not because of anything that you've done, but because everything that he's done. And so every single verse in the scripture should no longer be weaponized against you. Instead, the verses of scripture are a reflection of God's will for your good. 
All he's saying in the word is, if you would let my direction in, you will start to thrive here. And so we shouldn't, we shouldn't feel fear when we see some of these verses that pop up in Scripture. That's not what they're there for. Perfect love casts out fear. Amen? Amen? That's what we're supposed to experience is a love relationship with God. But he also comes and says, but here's wisdom. And that's, that's definitely what Proverbs is doing. And it's really what all of Scripture is doing. Saying, do you want to thrive as a human being? Do you want your relationships to thrive? Because everything in this world decays. Everything moves along a, 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 a path of death. And God comes in and says, do you want it to not die? Do you want it to not decay? Here's my plan. And so look at what else Solomon has to say. He says, they have to, he, he says it's good for people to eat and drink and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life that God has given them and to accept their lot or their share in life. Now, there's two really big pieces he's, he's uh, giving us here in the operating manual for life. Is he saying, number one, you should accept your job. You're like, well, I'm not as educated as that other person. I don't have as good a job as that other person. I'm looking forward to this promotion. Right? I don't make as much as that guy. Be done with all of that. It's good to have goals. It's good to work toward goals. But sometimes we're taught in this culture that we should never, ever be satisfied because the next promotion is always around the corner. And when you get that promotion, you'll, you won't be content or satisfied because the next one after that will be around the corner. And Solomon comes and says, no, accept what God has given you. That's wisdom. Yes? The other piece he says is enjoy it. Enjoy it. Because enjoyment and joy, they're not emotions, they're choices. So in the midst of your work, no matter what your work is, no matter how much you make, no matter what level you think you currently are, whether you're a stay-at-home uh, parent, whatever it is that you're doing, you're flipping burgers at McDonald's like I was or detasseling corn for heaven's sake, he says you can enjoy it. And it's, again, it's not emotions and it's not feeling. It's a choice. Do you see what Solomon is doing? He's coming in and saying, you can sit there and you can do the job and you can hate it the whole time or you can make a conscious decision to say, thank you, God, for what I'm given. And I can choose to enjoy the work that I've been given. There's this old pastor, and he told this story about a dinner party that he went to. And it was a brand new friend group for him. And he went to this dinner party. And while he was there, everything got done, and everybody was cleaning up. And it's this kind of group of friends where everybody did a job at the party. Ever been to one like that? Everybody did a job. They didn't just put it on the host. And so everybody was doing something. And he noticed the guy that was washing dishes. And he walks up to the guy washing dishes and he's like, can I wash the dishes so that I can help out? And the guy looks at him and he says, you can do it, but it depends. He said, are you going to wash the dishes to wash them? Or are you going to wash the dishes and kind of get through it just so that you can have some clean dishes at the end? There's a difference. He told the pastor, he said, I'm washing the dishes. And I'm washing them to wash them. We're taught in our culture to do everything for results. We're taught in our culture to muscle through and hate the now so that we can get to the result that's at the end. Instead of the sanity and the peace and the joy of enjoying what I'm doing today. And if you're mowing the lawn or washing the dishes or taking care of your kids, amen, somebody amen, come on. See, Solomon's coming at us with some sanity here and says, you're missing joy. God planned joy for you in your work. And some of us are missing it under the sun. There was a job I had as a company called Athena. And I had been designing software for a while at that point, and I got moved over into this one specific team. And there was just three of us, and the other two guys that were there were in cubicles, were in air conditioning, and were making good money, and it was, a, it was a wonderful job, okay? But there was just something that was in the heart of this team, and these guys every single day complained. And we weren't making enough, 
our budget wasn't big enough, the, the, the benefits, all of it, it was just all wrong. This company didn't understand how to appreciate what we were really bringing to the table. And it was on and on and on, every break, every discussion. And I was so immersed in it that I didn't even realize it. It wasn't until I finally left that team about nine months later and I got a new job in a new spot and I looked back and I'm like, oh my gosh, I was miserable because I gave into it and I complained right along with those guys. And so my daily experience of work, see, the thing is, if you imagine injustice against you, you will feel injustice. If you imagine misery, you will be miserable. And so your choice in the midst of it, here's Solomon saying, no, there's a blessing for you. No matter what kind of uh, inheritance you leave to your kids, see, there's a blessing for you that you could enjoy your work. And that's for us. We've got a complicated relationship with our work. And sometimes I think that we believe if we're not careful, and this is what today is all about, I think sometimes we believe if we're not careful that work is just something that's done to us. And what I would tell you is that I believe work, your work, is a gift from God to you. And I believe it's not just about what you get at the end. It's a gift from God to you in the daily, in the hourly. So I want you to watch the gifts that God brings. I believe there's eight different gifts that God brings you in your job today. In your job today. The very first one is the people that you get to work with. You're like, well, not that guy. <laughs> sure. <laughs> We've all got that guy. But how many people has God brought you in touch with through your work that you would not have been in touch with otherwise? How many deep bonds as you worked alongside each other, as you learned from each other, as you helped each other, did God bring lifelong friends God brought to you through your job? Just think about it for a moment. And all of a sudden you can start to be thankful. Oh God, I wouldn't have had them if it hadn't been for work. Mentors that God brought to you. Not that guy, the other guys, amen? The next gift that God brought to you is that work is an adventure. Work is actually an adventure that is better. It is better than what? It is better than a life of leisure. Again, it's another lie that's kind of there in our culture. Is that really in your 20s, you need to hit it big. And you need to write the, write the next New York Times bestseller. And then all of a sudden you retire early and then you just live a life of leisure. The problem is, is that all the statistical studies that have been done and they look at the more wealthy people get. Did you know they don't get happier? None of them. None of the studies go that way. Why? Because we thrive when we work. And again, there's balance. And you need Sabbath. And you need times of rest. And sleep is a gift from God. But work is for us. Why? It's like, because when I work, I get stretched. When I work, I get challenged. Haven't you learned things at work? Haven't goals been put in front of you? It's like, man, that's going to be really hard for me to achieve. And then you achieve it, and then you get to stand back, and you're like, thank you, God. I feel like I'm a different person than what I used to be because you have stretched me. You have developed me. I have become something because of work. It's a better adventure. The next uh, gift that God gives us is he gives you work integrity and the honor that comes along with it. Proverbs 16, 8, better to have little with godliness than to be rich and dishonest. So this one's got a modification. Maybe you're doing your job, but are you cheating? Maybe you're doing your job, are you stealing from your business? It's just some office supplies. It's just a computer that nobody was using anymore. And you introduce those things, and they, they hurt your integrity, don't they? And, and the converse is also true. And this is what the Proverbs is trying to tell us. It's like, it's better to even make less, but do it the right way. You've seen The Godfather before. 
Luca Brazzi swims with the fishes. Yes? Yes. What did the Godfather teach America? It taught us that you can do horrible things to each other as long as you put it under the umbrella of it's just business. Sorry your family was killed. It was just business. And somehow that makes sense in The Godfather. And we do this really weird American capitalism thing where we say, as long as the market will bear it and we'll overcharge customers and we know that it's wrong, but we talk ourselves into it and I'll steal and I'll cheat and I'll do, right, to get ahead. Proverbs comes along and says, no, your integrity matters. Because didn't integrity matter to our grandfathers? Come on, somebody. Didn't integrity matter to our grandfathers? And some of our grandfathers and our grandmothers, they got to a spot, and they didn't have as much as the next guy, but they had their honor. And we look back at that, and we're like, we've missed something. Haven't we missed something? See, that honor through integrity is a gift from God. Because we get to stand back, and we get to say, my kids have these things because we worked hard for them. And that's good. It doesn't make us better than anybody else, but we can certainly enjoy it. It's a gift. Next, non-Christians will respect Jesus. This is a surprising one. I'm jumping to 1 Thessalonians here. 4 verse 11, make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands, just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not believers will respect the way that you live, and you will not need to depend on others. Sometimes in the church, it can feel like we're holding up some jobs as more spiritual and better than other jobs. I would just show you this scripture really quick. Paul is talking about working with your hands. Where are my blue collar people at? Come on. Praise God. He says there's something about just your family loving Jesus Christ and living a quiet life and not making any trouble in your neighborhood, right? And work with your hands and just have the peace of that. And he's saying there's something about that kind of faithful lifestyle that if your family could achieve that, other people who don't know Jesus will start to respect Jesus somehow because you've been faithful at your job. Isn't that cool? Why? Because so many people aren't faithful at their job. And so many people don't have joy in their work. And just being faithful to the little things in this life, people will see Jesus there. Sometimes we complicate things too much, don't we? Next, I get to financially help other people. Ephesians 4, 28. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work. Here we go with hard work with your hands again. And then give generously to others in need. There's an amazing satisfaction that comes from working and getting a paycheck and being able to take some of those resources and help other people that are in need. What an amazing blessing. Again, ministry flows out of work. Another gift, my influence starts to grow. Proverbs 22, 29. Do you see any truly competent workers? They will serve kings rather than working for ordinary people. I know we aren't in a time of kings right now, but just see this in our current culture. What he's saying there is your influence grows. You're like, no, no, no. You don't get influence unless you go on social media and like you know how to stir up. No. He's saying work hard and be faithful and work with your hands and the right kind of influence will grow as a result something about faithfulness in all of that. Last two, and these, these are the most important two. Proverbs 13, 4 is about soul contentment. It says, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Again, don't weaponize this in your heart. It's not a threat. What he's saying is this is how it works. And if you understand how it works, blessing can come into your life as a result. But what's he say here? He says, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. What's that about? See, when we're lazy, we tend to want more and more stuff and we're never satisfied even with the things that we have. Have you ever had a period of time in your life like that? I have. That the lazier I got, the more difficult I was to please. 
I don't know why that is. It just is. And Solomon knows that. And he says, but there's something about working hard that reverses the whole pattern. And you start to find a deep contentment coming into your life. And it's not just any contentment. It's a soul contentment. Do you want this soul peace in your life? Work. Work. One of the reasons I think this is, is we work hard and we feel an ownership in our work and we feel an ownership in the blessings that come into our family. And we get to stand back and we get to feel a very special satisfaction from that. I got to go two and a half weeks with my family on vacation and it costs a lot of money to go on vacation. Amen? Where are the parents at? <laughs> but you get to stand back from it. and See, I know how hard I worked. I know how hard their mom worked. I know how much savings and how much planning and I know how much shopping and, you know, all the things went into us being able to enjoy those days together and you stand back from it and we didn't rob anybody to get there, right? We didn't cheat. We just, we, we, we did what we needed to do. And there's just a soul satisfaction that comes from that. Thank you, God, for that. See, we could have worked really hard and, and things still could have gone wrong, but they didn't. Thank you, God. See the soul contentment? God wants that for you. See that in your car. See that in your house. See that in the things that you have. These are gifts from the Lord. And then the last thing, I get to bring my creator pleasure. Colossians 3, 23. This is so big. Whatever you do, work wholeheartedly as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So when you work, it's the last thing. He says, you're not working for your supervisor. You think you are, but you're not. The ultimate supervisor is in heaven. And there's something about a Christian that no matter what I'm doing, and, and whether it's minimum wage or whether it's salary, what, whatever it is, that I do it and I do it for an audience of one. And I bring my quality and I bring my integrity and I bring my faithfulness for an audience of one. And that's why, like the ant, I don't need a supervisor to watch over me. I'm going to do the right thing today. And the reason is, is because my work itself, it's worship. Like, well, how's that worship? That's not singing. Worship is a bigger word than singing. Worship means that with my life, I'm showing adoration and worth to the only worthy one. And I say with my faithful work, he's worth it whether I make more money or not. I give pleasure to my creator. And some of you, your hearts don't run that way yet. That's okay. But that's the way of peace. That's the way of real joy. It's coming to a space where no matter what you're doing, it's for him. And once you get addicted to that idea, you'll be unstoppable. Once you get addicted to that idea that I'm not gonna do all these things, because my mom said so, my dad said so, because I have to be ahead, because I have to achieve, I have to have that title, I have to have that promotion, I have to have this house that's this size because it's just as big as everybody else on the street. I've gotta see what I'm doing, I'm serving all those people, I'm serving all those ideas, and then you stop and you say, no, I'm just gonna serve him, then everything changes. Okay, would you guys stand? Is that bacon all right today? Everybody do okay? I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask God to give us some healing in this realm of work. But ask yourself honestly real quick. Do you have mixed feelings about your work? Has work maybe not been a joy to you? Has God challenged you with some of his gifts today, what he's got for you in that place. Let's pray for that. Lord God, we thank you so much, Lord, for work. Thank you, Lord, that it's not, a, it's not an accident, it's not a mistake, Lord, but the work that you've given us, Lord, has a purpose. And Lord, you've got good things for us, not just at the end of work, Lord, but on the daily, on the hourly, Lord. 
God, would you make us a satisfied and a content people in what you've given us? Help us, Jesus, to ignore and to put aside culture and to really start doing this life in the way of Jesus. Come, Lord, and rescue every part of us. Thank you for our dads today, Lord. We love them. Pray that they would feel honored, Lord. I pray you bless our celebrations today. We love you, Jesus, in Christ's name. Amen.